Sorry. How's it going? Thank you for, for coming. So, uh, so I think last time, like on, on Tuesday, I think we pretty much sort of discussed, or at least began to discuss, these bits here. And uh, so let's try and discuss some of these today. Um, and I, I think we'll start talking about, well, first of all, I'm actually going to talk about a kind of mini homework, which is just to present some initial ideas on the project, because we're going to kind of work through that together. Um, but after that, I'll talk about uh, mind reading, kind of discuss this question of you know, what is it, and should it be called that, and if it shouldn't, and what should it be called, and what would deserve that name. Uh, and then we're going to think about uh, what neural representations are, what they mean, how we might try and look at them. Um, and we might, we might or might not get to the last one, this is something we can this this will be this last one about how do you how do you find out more about a particular question will be irrelevant more to undergrads and more for people who are kind of thinking of doing uh, the kind of pseudo grant proposal experiment design idea as their project. Although I think it's relevant for anything in general. So um, okay, so the first thing I just want to say so next week um, next week is not so much about readings but more about. Uh, exploring in MATLAB some uh, aspects of uh, hemodynamic response functions and the structure of design matrix. So instead of the, the homework being to answer some mini questions about readings, <coughs> it's going to be uh, email me some short initial thoughts, and they can be very short and very initial, uh, about what you might be interested in doing your class project on, if you're enrolled in the class for credit, obviously. Um, and uh, so a few things I want to say about that. First of all, the whole point of, of this is um, to kind of bounce some ideas around. So it's not at all the idea that that which you declare an interest in right now is, you know, you're kind of locked in forever. That's what you have to do your project on, not at all. It's just kind of to get you kind of thinking about it a bit. And uh, it's entirely reasonable also to say, you know, I really don't know what I want to do my project on, but. I'm kind of into, you know, when in the very first homework I said, well, you know, what's a question that you're interested in? That might be a good basis of it, you know. So, so, uh, so anyway, so I, my my thoughts are, but but I'm open to other suggestions. Uh, is there's two kind of main directions this could go. Uh, uh, so one is um, to analyze a data set, and as I mentioned before, but I would definitely encourage you. To, uh, as part of the homework, to go and have a look at this website, openfmri.org. Uh, and it does, I think there's about maybe 10 data sets on there present. And uh, see if any of them catch your eye. There's, uh, one of them is the Haxby data set that we already started to look at a little bit. Others are from um, more kind of neuroeconomics y type tasks, others are from decision making. Uh, they're mo not all of them, but many of them are from the lab of my former postdoc advisor, Russ Poldrack. He's kind of been quite pioneering in this whole kind of open data sharing movement in fMRI, which I think is a very good thing. Um, and there's actually a whole bunch of other fMRI and MRI data sets out there on the web, and you can, if you don't like any of the ones on open fMRI, which is entirely reasonable, then feel free to Google around. Feel free to Google around anyway. You probably you'll probably find data sets that I don't even know about. That's quite likely because there's new ones coming out all the time. So so if you think that something that that uh, uh, you would be interested in doing your own new analysis, then find find you know have a look at some of these data sets and see see if any of them catch your eye, and then that might be a good basis. Even if you don't think that you want to do a project on analysis, I think it would be kind of worth having a look at that anyway. Now, if you dis if you think that um, you don't necessarily want to plunge into uh, doing your own analysis, and by the way, like I said, what you suggest in your in this initial idea does not lock you into anything. Uh, then another thing that I think could be useful would be to kind of say, well, you know, I want to. There's this question that I would like to ask about 
the brain or about behavior or about cognition or about any number of topics. And uh, I think that it would be kind of nice to design an experiment on it and to see if I can kind of bash my head against this question of how could we actually cast any light on this phenomenon that I care about using fMRI. And I think that, you know, one of my, my hope is that one of the themes of the course will be that if you bash your head against it hard enough and, you know, with some back and forth, you actually probably will be able to cast some interesting light on it. Almost certainly the kind of zeroth order thing of just saying, well, you know, we'll see which part of the brain lights up for this phenomenon won't in itself be the thing which will cast interesting light on it, but it might be the first step. You know, then the question is, well, okay, it's here or it's here, well, you know, then what? And so, uh, and like I say, you know, there's no reason whatsoever why these should be clear or fully formed ideas at this stage. And I think it would actually probably be premature for them to be clear or fully formed ideas at this stage, except, you know, I know some of you are already doing this kind of work. Uh, so, uh, so do not feel at all reticent about these being just more kind of exploratory directions. That's kind of the idea, actually. I would, I would much prefer you to say, you know, I'm, I'm kind of sort of interested in this, you know, what do you think, than to say, you know, here's my, my blueprint and I'm now going to implement it, unless, unless you really are sure, in which case that's fine too. And so those are two suggestions. Those are what, what I think would probably be two good directions to go, but I do not think that that exhausts the possibilities. And I'm, I'm extremely sure that you'll be able to think of, if neither of those two appeal to you, you'll be able to think of something more interesting or more appropriate for your interests. Or, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy and willing to be surprised. So, you know, suggest, suggest something else and we'll chat about it. So that's, that's a, in an attempt to kind of, <clears throat> you know, move this project along because I certainly don't want the, the project to be something which is just this kind of <clears throat> lump of stuff which just has to arrive at the end without any, any steps along the way with me kind of uh, helping, hopefully, uh, and giving some guideposts. So, so, that's, that's, uh, so that's instead of um, answering some mini questions this week. Uh, and and uh, I just want to emphasize that this, this can be, you know, short. I do not <coughs> either expect or want, you know, some like big multi-page kind of extremely detailed thing at this stage. I mean, you can if you want. Uh, so, so let's talk about mind reading. Uh, and mind reading, well, we'll decide whether mind reading is a good word or not. Um, but uh, but one, of, you know, one of the papers that we read for this week, a very nice review, the, the one in uh, Trends in Cognitive Sciences, or TICS as people call it, uh, called Beyond Mind Reading uh, by uh, Norman et al. And uh, you'll, you'll see this, this phrase, mind reading, used a lot in discussions of fMRI, especially fMRI decoding, especially in the press, but also in actual academic articles. So I think it's worth thinking about what, what on earth are people meaning by this? Because this is a very strange, eye-catching phrase. And uh, is it a reasonable description of the senses in which things uh, that actually get done with fMRI fall very far short of that? What might be a better way of thinking about that? So this is, and I don't even think necessarily that there's a single right answer to this question. So this is something that I think it will be useful for us to discuss and think about. And uh, you can probably guess at this point I'm going to say, Turn to your neighbors and, uh, and uh, just uh, grab like, you know, groups of like three, three or four people and um, uh, tell them and tell them about what you think about what on earth is meant by this idea of mind reading um, and uh, does it seem reasonable? Have you seen any examples of fMRI studies that actually do seem to merit the name? Have you seen any examples of studies which kind of get hyped as that which just seem ridiculous or just you know, what would, if, if there's nothing right now that seems to meet that, could you imagine something that you think, well, if they could really do this, then that would count. So let, let, let's talk and think about that for a bit, and then we'll, uh, we'll all discuss it as a class. So turn around into like groups of like three, four, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. So, okay, so this is, I just remember reading this line, because they mentioned, uh, they mentioned mind reading. And I, and I thought, okay, so is it just simply being able to decode? So, so I think, you know, girls are going through the mind reading, including the distinction of decoding. So, 
I don't know, because it makes me think it's like, yes, you know, we try to stray away from the idea that there's a uh, brain region that does actually only act as And then so it's like, well, now we get more specific measures, because uh, it's just, just a fancier way of doing that same thing. And instead of saying it's a brain region, you know, we have it as activity in the region. I feel like um, all you can really say is that information is in the present. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. right. yeah. so uh, definitely say that. Yes. Yeah. And what that means. Uh, so I, I guess one way in which it really falls short of Really sort of mindless, or, or like a sort of colloquial sense of the like, oh no, they're going to like, be able to relate thoughts, is that, you know, it's not domain so general. Like, it's not like um, you can have your mind and know what you thought. It's like, what happens with you? Like, you know, like, bring our um, support vector machine or whatever based on like, us knowing and having the data. Right? It's not, it's not like we have a claim place for words. As far as I know, we have to do it.
they had subjects watch different movies. Um, and uh, while in the scene, and basically were trying to decide on one of the different tracks, which video was being watched. They were just databases in that many, many videos. And we started out with that. Okay, so uh, so what what kind of uh, what kind of thoughts have uh, have you guys uh, come up with? Sorry to uh, to cut off cut off discussions in mid uh, flow. By the way, actually, just you know, before we get to this, I'm, as you can probably tell, I am kind of experimenting around a bit. There's this whole kind of like discuss things. Is this are you? And feel free to say you know, or you can post it anonymously on Piazza if you want. Is this actually seeming like a useful uh, or useless activity? I know it's a little bit different, but uh, my, my, I mean, it's obvious that the aim is to kind of get people just a bit more kind of like awake and thinking about and kind of engaged in the question. But is it in any shape or form? What are your thoughts? Or is it just like, oh yeah, this is that class where we all chit chat about random <laughs> stuff for like five minutes? <laughs> I think it's nice, but it could be a lot shorter. Okay, that's that's very useful feedback. Okay, that's good. Okay, so. So I mean, I think I think that's a very good point. I mean, this this question of like what is meant by mind reading. I mean, there's there's entire you know long long papers about it. But equally, there's no reason why the beginning of the classes should be something that people necessarily have like a great deal of to say about. So so I think I think that's actually a good point that uh, you know you might hopefully at the end of the class you might have you know. A kind of class worths of thinking about this to, to, to speak about, but at the beginning it's like, well, 
you know, it's kind of an interesting question, but I guess I'll be learning about it in the coming weeks. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that, that's helpful. I appreciate that. Okay. So, so, uh, so, what what kinds of uh, what what kinds of uh, thoughts did people have? And uh, and there is, by the way, no right or wrong or even agreed upon answer on this. So, whatever you think, it's probably actually you know, do not worry about whether it's a a worthwhile or valid thought because it almost certainly is. These are very very open questions. Was anyone of the opinion that? To call something mind reading at this point is a horrible and a horrible hype, which is actually a reasonable viewpoint. Okay, so t tell me a little bit about how this is hype. Well, I think mind is so well un or not well defined that to me, if I hear mind reading, I, I kind of already start wondering if the person knows what they're talking about. Okay, okay, no, I think that's a very good point. I mean, Mind, mind is it? Yeah, I mean, well, this is this is actually this is a question that's as old as the study of psychology, right? Uh, I mean, without uh, going into too much of it, right? I mean, there was a time for a, at least a, at least two or three decades when you uh, people who were in psychology departments would never actually talk about the mind. They would never talk about mental representation or cognition because that was considered an incorrect and, and naive thing to do, and that was the reign of of radical behaviorism, people like Skinner, and that was, uh, you know, for at least up the first few decades of of, uh, of the 20th century. So that that was a, uh, and and even, and to this day, there's you know there's still a lot of open questions on this. So, uh, I mean, for instance, probably the the last kind of taboo topic, which um, for a while it was you were just considered a fool even to think talk about, but which people study quite a lot about now is consciousness. So for a long time it was thought, you know, if you're going to talk about consciousness, then you're just a charlatan or a crank. And now there's entire conferences on it. But still, there's lots and lots of very open questions, and there's some people who still think that, uh, that you know, uh, you're a charlatan or a crank, if you think about that. So, so this whole question of, you know, what do you mean by mind, I agree, is a very difficult question. So to say, not only do we know what we're talking about by the mind, but we've got it down so good that we can read it, that's, that's a problematic statement. So I think that's very reasonable. Does, does anyone think there were any senses in which they've seen stuff or read stuff where they thought, okay, maybe not mind reading, but there's there's something going on here? What what would count as, uh, let's say, what would count as a kind of like lowercase m, lowercase r mind reading, like getting getting some information about someone's mental processes out of them using a a scanner. Does anyone would, would do people feel that that is something which reasonably describes stuff that they've seen or, or read about? You can usually tell if someone is really like if they're learning how to do something for the first time, if they're really good at it, um, versus if it's the first time they've ever tried something before. Okay, that, that's so that was the first. That was what we thought. Might be okay, no, that's very interesting. Now, now, are you talking here about? From observing somebody's behavior, or are you talking about from doing an imaging scan? An imaging I, scan. Okay, yeah. okay, that's interesting. Because, in a sense, in a sense, we're all doing mind reading all the time. Whenever we just look at each other, right? If I say, "Hmm, yeah, that he," I saw him in the car. He looked kind of worried, right? We look, you know, we're taking some data from him, namely his facial expression and we're inferring some inner mental state about him, quite an abstract mental state in this case, and we're kind of good at that too. And all you need to do that is glance at someone for a split second. You don't need to you know, put them in a million dollar scanner, let alone eat, or even uh, get them to push some buttons in a behavioral testing lab. So, uh, so there's a sense in which we're, you know, we're inferring things about other people's minds all the time based on just purely behavioral cues. And so I think your point about discovering whether somebody is practiced or kind of a newbie at a particular task is a very interesting one because that's one of the cases in which you almost certainly could. And I, yeah, I, I, I think I'd have to check. I'm pretty sure there's some fMRI studies. Of, yeah, there are fMRI studies of that kind of thing, maybe not necessarily mind reading test studies. But, but there's a sense in which you can actually the bar is set very high because you can tell a lot from behavior. And in fact, this is one of the things I'm going to try and be emphasizing in the course, and I'll discuss this actually in, a, in just a minute. Uh, if, if the thing that you're trying to infer with brain imaging is something which you can infer 
just as well just by kind of looking at someone or maybe asking someone. It's amazing how much you can get just from asking someone, right, if they're willing to tell you. Uh, then, you know, you, you're, just as your mind reading when you look at someone, you say, oh, I think he looks worried, I think he looks happy. You're mind reading when you see somebody, you know, playing tennis and you say, oh, he's a pro. Or I think that person needs some lessons. Right? You're discovering something quite high level about their, their skills state in that case. So um, any other thoughts? Is anyone, maybe, uh, some, I know some of you are, are, have read, you know, I already work in this area. Do any of you have, have kind of seen papers where you thought, wow, they really are kind of getting something out of someone's head? Or, or, or conversely, uh, uh, yeah. There's some, just found this paper that's uh, reconstructing images. So we can reconstruct mm. images that subjects have seen based on the patterns. Of, right, you know, right. The, 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 the Jack Galan stuff, of, right? Yeah. We were well, looking yeah. Really yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, so, so when I, last week actually I sent out an email saying, hey, what news stories have people seen? And two people who I terribly regret, I'm forgetting the names of, but it's up on Piazza, posted very nice replies. And one of them posted to a, uh, to, to those of you who posted that, if I'm not remembering, I'm sorry, I'll go and check afterwards. Uh, um, one of them posted to uh, a, a recent kind of Nature News article about this kind of stuff that prominently featured this Galant stuff. If we have time, we're going to check. And the Galant Lab, we're going we're gonna to have a whole class, or in basically almost entirely, about that work, because that is some of the best work that's being done at the minute. It's very, very interesting work. Um, and uh, one of the many, many good things that they do is they actually make nice YouTube videos about their work, which shows, and their work actually uses YouTube videos as input. So did you guys watch this video? Yeah. Uh, so we'll, we'll show this in the class too, because it's really worth watching, um, in which they actually, basically, they show people a whole bunch of videos, record their brain image, their brain activity while they're doing them, then afterwards, uh, show people, so those are like the training set, they know what videos are people watching. And in the testing set, they show them some videos that they don't know what they are, but they can just look at the brain activation and they can actually get to some reasonably, and you can actually see on the video, they, they can't say, okay, you're looking at precisely this, you know, you're watching episode three, season two of The Simpsons or something, but they can say, yeah, there's a kind of big blobby orange thing that might be a car over on the left and there's some green stuff over on the right. And it's actually kind of right. It's, it's quite impressive stuff, actually. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that, understand how it works, and make that look a little bit, you know, kind of get behind what, because it looks almost like magic, right? Look at what the, the, uh, what's going on there, see what the kind of strengths and limitations are. But, but that's, that's, you know, that's actually looking inside somebody's head with the scanner and uh, getting a much better than chance guess about what their, um, what, what's happening, what, what visual stimuli they're actually seeing, without having to peek and look at you know what's on the TV screen in front of them. So that's that's kind of in fact, uh, I haven't assigned this as one of the readings, but but you might think, well, what's the next logical step after that to make it even more impressive? Would be, um, hey, what about if somebody was dreaming, and you could sort of kind of get a picture of what they were dreaming of? Now it sounds almost like a little bit silly. There's actually a paper about that that came out in Science, and it's it's pretty. Well, let's say it's getting into the more controversial end, but that's, they use essentially the same methods. They basically use the Galant type methods, except they do it for people who are streaming, and they, they do score a lot better than chance. So, but the, um, and so we're gonna uh, try and understand what, what kind of stuff is going on there. So that's, that's I would say, towards the end of the less, less hypey sense of, uh, of mind reading. But, um, but do you remember, uh, so last, uh, uh, in the last class we were talking about, well, um, you know, what are times where you're interacting with the classifier and it kind of does really well versus when it does really badly. And, uh, and one person gave a very nice example of, well, you know, it can be pretty good if, say, you're calling up an airline and you're trying to decide if it's arrivals or departures. Okay? So if those are your two options, uh, and the job is to say, you know, was it this or was it this? And they're quite different from each other. The, uh, the automatic voice recognition software is pretty good at figuring out if you said arrivals or departures. But if you could be saying anything, if they don't know, you know, you might be saying, oh, I think I left my umbrella at the, uh, 
you know, the airport checking counter, did anyone find it? Then, then they're hopeless, they have no clue. So, so you know, what, if you see a, you know, on a kind of magic show, a mind reader, the idea is that it doesn't matter what you're thinking, they're gonna kind of peer into your soul and read it, okay? So that, that's kind of like the equivalent of, you know, you're speaking into the phone and you might be asking about anything. Well, there has to be a human being at the other end of that phone line. If there's an automated classified system at the other end of that phone line, it's not gonna be in any luck. So it's very, very similar to that with this fMRI mind reading. It goes a little bit beyond this, as we'll discuss. But so if, if the scanner's job is to figure out, you know, was this guy looking at a face or were they looking at a house? That's very, very similar from a computational point of view to figuring out, was this guy saying arrivals or departures? But if the problem is, you know, they could have been thinking about, well, anything, they, uh, then then you know we're not even close. Now one of the, one of the things that's, that's impressive about that uh, Jack Gallant lab work that we're going to look at later in the course is that it kind of broadens that scope somewhat. So it's it's not just a kind of either or you know was it was it this thing or that thing, but it, it's covering it's kind of covering a space, and we're going to talk about what that means a little bit. So there's a whole range of images. But um, but anyway, when I uh, when I pose this as a uh, as a question in email, and I said, you know, you don't have to write an answer. But a couple of people wrote, wrote back, and, and one of them was just particularly nice, and I asked her if, uh, I said, this is so good, can I quote this in class, please, so with her permission. She's actually sick at home right now, so she's not here. So if you're watching this on YouTube, hello, Megan. Uh, uh, it's difficult, uh, so w this is trying to summarize the, the fact that it's difficult to get measures from inside the head that tell us more than you can get from outside the head, kind of like what we were talking about with your example. So she wrote this. What I didn't like about the second article, that was the, the trends in cognitive science along with the mind reading in the title, was it called this all mind reading? I think that's really dangerous considering that we thought the same from differences in cardiac response and galvanic skin response, especially in lie detection. So, so let's unpack, I mean, I think that's a really nice statement. So let's unpack that bit. So what it means is, so in this case, we're trying to figure out is someone telling the truth or lying? Now that would be the kind of mind reading, right? And people have wanted to do this for a long time, right? Since the dawn of mankind, I suppose. Um, and uh, one of the well, 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 someone, someone, tell me in approximately what you know. One of these kind of old style, well, they still use them polygraph fMRI, uh, polygraph lie detectors does. Like, what, 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 what in general? What's the idea behind those? Like in the, you know, like you see on like a TV crime drama or something. People still use them, I believe. So I, I think they just look at um, increased um, heart rate or um, uh, organic skin responses, just like measuring how much you're sweating. Or right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Um, Autonomic processes. Yeah. Exactly. So, so the idea is that you know, if someone's telling the truth, they'll feel kind of calm and collected. If somebody's lying, they'll be kind of sweaty and nervous, and their heart will start racing. And, uh, and and this this kind of autonomic response is the phrase. It basically means this is the stuff that you don't really have conscious control of. This is all just kind of governed by your brain under the hood, if you like. So even if you're you know trying your best to look calm and collected, you still can't really control your heart rate. I mean, people can to some degree. You still can't really stop your hand from sweating. And so the idea is that this is a, well, it's a behavioral measure. Well, let's say it's an external measure. It's a measure from outside your head for sure. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not an overt measure because you can't tell just by looking at someone. But if you stick some sensors on them, you can say, okay, I can discover more about your internal processes than I can just from your outwardly observable behavior. And in a sense, you might say, well, you know, that's really the kind of bar that has to be set for brain imaging because if you can't tell anything from looking inside someone's head over and above what you could get from outside their head, then why bother? So, so this is not going inside the head, but it's trying to get behind overt behavior. And the problem with, uh, with this so-called uh, lie detection is it doesn't really work very well. And it's, I, I'm not a legal expert, but I don't, th I think for the most part it's not admissible in court. Does anyone know that? I mean, I think that like companies use it and stuff on job applicants and stuff because yeah. you know, there's no, I think some people actually do, there's no, because you know, they're not obligated by any, you know, legal system, they can do whatever they want. 
But um, there's actually a very interesting uh, recent review, one of the, I think the most recent nature reviews in neuroscience, all about use of fMRI for light detection, if that's something that you're interested in. But, uh, but the, so, so this, I think that this quote from Megan really nicely highlights two problems. So one is that you can get stuff, important stuff about internal workings just from outside the head. In this case, from kind of sensors on the skin, or in other, in other cases, from behavior, or from looking at someone's face. Uh, and the other is that these might be highly unreliable. And it, it can even be difficult to tell how reliable it is. So, um, so I think so that I think that kind of covers some of the spectrum of mind reading. So, in one sense, you know, there were actually a couple of com companies out there that were trying to use fMRI to do lie detection. At least one of them has, has ceased business now. It typically isn't admitted admitted in court, but that might change any minute. Um, but. You could, you, if you're trying to restrict yourself to a very narrow space, like is it arrivals or departures, where they're looking at a face in the house, you might be okay. If you're trying to get to a broader space, it gets much more difficult. But some people at the kind of cutting edge, like uh, Jack Lance work that we're going to look at later, are getting somewhat further in that direction. So, so I'm, what I'm trying to encourage is a kind of somewhat, you know, look on these ideas of mind reading with a, with a skeptical eye, um, but also with an open mind because people are doing some quite interesting stuff. So, um, so this kind of gets us to this question of you know what neural decoding. So last you know, on Tuesday we talked a lot about what neural decoding is, and and I think it really gets to the question of what it tells us and what it doesn't tell us. And this is something that you know we're going to see over the course of the class. So, um, I think what it does tell us is, well, we've already seen how, uh, discussed a little bit, how fMRI is a very noisy and indirect measure. You've seen some of the noise, those of you who are in the computer practical when we were looking at the, uh, the Haxby uh, data set, and you were kind of looking at individual time courses. Some of them, a few, very few of them, actually do kind of cleanly look like they go up and down, but even those are not that clean. They're quite jaggedy, and there's all kinds of noise and drift on them. And that's about as, as clean a signal as you'll ever get. Uh, so it's a noisy and it's an indirect measure because you're measuring um, blood oxygenation, not the neural activation itself. But the fact that you can take MRI signal, throw it into some kind of classifier, and figure out with better than chance, quite a lot better than chance in fact, what somebody was looking at or what somebody with that task somebody was doing, means that there really is some information in there. So it's a horrible, noisy, crummy indirect signal but it's not that horrible and noisy and indirect because there's actually enough information in there that get, can get pulled out that say, oh yeah, you know, this guy was looking at the house. Um, but there's still lots of things it doesn't tell us. So for instance, it doesn't tell us, just because you can pull some information out of something, it doesn't tell you that the brain is actually, actually cares about that or that the brain is doing anything that is similar. I mean, certainly the brain is not slicing itself up into voxels and putting those voxels into a classifier. Um, and it doesn't tell us about how this information is represented in the brain. This is the next thing we're really going to think about. Um, what, does it, what does it even mean to look at, to, what does it mean for something to be uh, mentally represented? And, uh, you know, for, for, some, for something to, for information to carry meaning, what does that actually mean? So uh, this is going to get almost kind of philosophical for a little bit, but I think this is actually important to think about. So. Um, so is it even possible for a brain image to tell us about mental representations? And what is a mental representation anyway? Uh, I mean, if you, if you study, there's no agreed upon answer to this question, by the way, just in case you're wondering. But almost every question in this course, or in fact in any cognitive science or cognitive neuroscience course, or psychology course, there will be no universally agreed upon answer. Because it's that kind of field, which, you know, in my opinion, makes it more interesting, but also can make it more perplexing, difficult to. So what is a mental representation anyway? So uh, I, I like I like this picture. How, how many of you have seen this picture before? Yeah. So this is uh, I don't know if you can see on this not particularly high res uh, projector, but this is a uh, this is painted by Renan Magritte, and it's uh, you know, it kind of looks like. It, and can you see that there's like a kind of painting and an easel in front of this? Anyway. So this is called the human condition, and it's meant to kind of capture this idea that this whole question of how we mentally, internally represent something 
that's out there in the world is actually kind of a perplexing question. So, so here's a look at some here's a look at some representations, and they're all in some shape or form representations of cat, but they're all very different. Okay, so obviously one of them is a picture of a cat. One of them's another picture of a cat, but obviously a very different kind of picture of a cat. And you might ask yourself, in what sense are these both pictures of cats? So you can look at that, your brain can look at that, and without even pausing to break a sweat, it says, oh yeah, they're both pictures of cats. But there's very, they're very, very different senses in which they're pictures of cats, and to even to even figure out, uh, it's, for instance, it's not that easy. This is a kind of test of you know how how easy is something that your brain your brain can do something very easily, but how easy is it really? It's really quite difficult to to train a, a computer algorithm to figure out that these things are both cats I, I, without kind of you know very very explicitly you know giving it the label oh yeah you know this one here is a cat, but to, to capture some kind of commonality between them. And then we have this abstract representation, you know, the word cat, or even, or even more abstract than that, the, the concept cat, you know, which you may or may not be distinct from the word cat. Uh, so there's, there's some relation between this representation of a cat and that representation of a cat, but it is not very clear what that relation is. And uh, there's, you know, there's not just entire papers, there's entire libraries full of books written about the what is the relationship between this representation of cat and that representation of cat. So do not do not be alarmed if you consider that to be a, you know an unclear, or difficult question because that's that's kind of a biggie. I think it's why like most of us have jobs. <laughs> right, <laughs> trying to figure these things out. Right, right, yeah. exactly. Okay, good. Well, I'm pleased that I'm pleased. Thank you, Fran. I'm yeah. pleased you're with me on this. Yeah. So, so, by the way, you know, so at least one of you considers this to be an interesting question. But if you don't, then that's reasonable too because you can you know you can uh, you can you can get through. You can do fMRI without having to worry about this kind of question, but I personally believe that there's types of questions you can ask which actually you know, boil down to particular experiments which may be related to this kind of question. Okay, so here's another type of, um, here's another type of representation of, of, of what a cat is. Namely, it's uh, you know, phylum and genus and family, and I don't even know the names of all of these different levels here. But this is, this is a, a kind of, Description of how cats fit into the broader structure of the world and animal kingdom, okay? which, if you think about it, is actually a very important part of what you understand by a cat, right? I mean, a cat is not just this kind of, you know, furry thing, right? But it's, you know, it, this is all this. This is kind of one of the reasons why it's very hard for cognitive science and psychology to kind of unpack these things is because this all happens so automatically in us that we don't even notice it. But you know, the moment you think about cats, you're also thinking, yeah, these are things which are alive, which kind of crawl around, which are furry, which are warm-blooded, which kind of, you know, eat eat little mice, which are carnivores, right? They're mammals. They've got a backbone. That they're, they're animals as opposed to plants. You know, whatever it mean, whatever it means to be an animal, that which is. And then there's some particular subtype of carnivores. I don't know what the definition of that is. Then there's the cat subtype. And then they're like the domestic cat subtype, as opposed to you know a wild cat or a you know a leopard or a, a tiger or something like that. So so all of these different types of knowledge and and representation are all somehow represented in our mind, in our brain, uh, for this concept of cat. So so this question of what is a representation is kind of actually a you know pretty unclear and multifaceted one. Which means if we're going to try and ask this question of what are neural representations, we, we should kind of have at the back of our mind this thought: well, there may be different types of different ways of representing things. And I think this is reflected in uh, in ways in which you might want to try and look at um, look at the neural data. So here's uh, here's a kind of famous picture from from uh, some of the early days of brain mapping. In which case, this is literally literally uh, taking the brain out of the head and uh, this is not this is not non-invasive brain mapping. And this is from 1982. <laughs> this is from a cat by the way, it's not from human brain. Uh, this is from 1982 and many of you probably weren't even born in 1982. So this is this is kind of old history in a way. Have any of you seen this 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 picture before? Okay. 
Would any of you who've seen this picture like to tell me what it is? Yeah, okay. Uh, it's image from 2-deoxyglucose autoradiography of a cat showing the, uh, being shown the picture at top. And then this method stains the uh, brain at the bottom. Uh, so when the cortex is removed and unfolded, that's the receptive field mapping of the upper image. Right, right, that's exactly right. That was, uh, yeah, uh, no, that's exactly right. So, so basically, you give, a, uh, you give an animal some radioactively tagged sugar, um, and, uh, and um, just as when the brain is more active, it uses more oxygen, and extra oxygen gets sent, it also uses up more sugar. In fact, using more oxygen and using more sugar are kind of metabolically extremely closely related. Uh, so you give some, uh, some radioactively tagged sugar, and you show this thing, this kind of flashing checkerboard spirally uh, type thing, and the, the cat is uh, fixating right here. It's very important that the, it has to keep its eyes right there. And uh, you know, you've, as you know from pictures of brains, there are these kind of wrinkly, folded up things. But you can literally, you know, take that part off. You can literally kind of peel off the cortex very carefully and flatten it, literally kind of, you know, between two pieces of glass, again, very carefully. You can only do that for kind of patches of cortex, because you can't do this whole thing. It would just tear open. It's like trying to kind of peel an orange. Um, and, uh, and you can say, OK, well, where did the extra sugar get taken up? And um, you can kind of sort of see that, in fact, literally this pattern Gets, gets reproduced in the brain. This is just the primary visual cortex of the brain. It's a little bit low on the screen, so I don't know if you can see. But in fact, it's not the whole pattern. It's just half of the pattern, so it's like this half here, because the, you've, got, you've got your two hemispheres of the brain, and uh, one side of the visual image goes to one hemisphere. So, so half of this pattern, and it also gets distorted in a strange way. So if you imagine, uh, I mean, there's kind of nice animations of this, but I don't have one here. But if you imagine taking this part here, and blowing it up, and making it bigger and bigger, so it kind of stretches out, and then these bits get smaller and smaller because the brain has a very big representation of the central part of visual field called the fovea, and much smaller representation of the periphery. So it kind of blow this up and make it bigger. That ends up over here. This is kind of a magnified, literally a magnified version of that, and then um, kind of stretch this out, and these kind of these. Uh, arc lines here become kind of these straight vertical lines, and these, these radial lines here become these. So this is literally a picture of the outside world on your brain, but a kind of distorted picture. So that's a sense. That's a sense in which primary visual cortex of the cat, and we have a essentially the same map in our own heads, is representing the world. <coughs> 